Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, Why Whales, wherever you are in the world today. Um, really special uh, event we have today. This is a Why Web 3 event, uh, and we're going to be talking about the music industry. I've, as you know, I've got a few extra people with me today. Uh, my co-host today is Sue Marks, and we've got two guests, uh, Jeffrey Vaughn and Jeff Burrows. Um, and we're really excited to talk about the industry today, and we brought some industry experts with us. So when we're kind of thinking about where uh, Web 3 is today and, and what use cases, real-world utility can be be brought to Web3, um, I, I get pitched quite often, you know, music concepts, you know, hey, I can I can digitize an album, I can use smart contracts uh, to, to help facilitate royalties as they flow through and all these other other items. But very rarely are the people pitching me these concepts and these these um, the, these ideas have any idea how the traditional uh, industry works. And I think it's very important that um, to understand where we are today before you can think about where we're going to go in the future. Um, so real quick, Sue, was there any uh, opening thoughts you had before we uh, jump into the kind of a little bit of a background? Well, I think what's really special about our guest today, Jay, is that Jeff and Jeff both have deeply uh, successful backgrounds in the traditional music industry, and they are both moving into and really embracing and leading the charge of what music is going to become and how listeners are going to be able to access music and how artists are going to be able to access their fans and distribute their, their music. So I'm really excited to hear what they have to say. And, and when we think about the digital transformation that music is going through, I mean, just think, we used to buy, I mean, I'm old enough to remember LPs, okay? <laughs> and then cassettes, and then, of course, we had CDs, right? And now we have streaming. So, um, so really excited to hear what you both have to say. And it's true that your industry is already, this industry has already gone through a massive digitization over the last decade. Um, now the, but the commerce has never changed. Um, those metrics and, and royalties have, have stayed very stagnant and, and while the technology advanced for users. Um, so let's, let's kind of jump in and get some background and then dive right into this, this hot topic here. Uh, Mr. Vaughn, uh, where'd you come from? How'd you end up here today? Yeah. First of all, um, Jay, Sue, thanks for having me. Jeff, it's great to run into you um, on this panel. Um, Jeff and I go back um, and probably have a lot of shared war stories to talk about if we get into it today. So I'm um, really looking forward to being here. Thank you, YPO. Thank you, Y Wales. Um, my background, uh, I was born in Northern Virginia, uh, grew up in that area, spent some time in Connecticut as well. Uh, graduated from Duke in 2008 and moved to LA shortly thereafter to per per pursue my, my dreams of, um, you know, music. Uh, music industry success. Um, I started my career in the mailroom at United Talent Agency, which for those of us in entertainment, um, starting in the mailroom of one of the big agencies is almost a rite of passage uh, for a lot of folks in the film and TV and music businesses. And so that was a really formative, great experience. Spent two and a half years at UTA, worked in, um, worked in, uh, worked with actors and both TV talent and motion picture talent on my way to working for the head of music, uh, who at the time was Rob Prinz. Um, and, uh, you know, the more I got a taste of the agent life, the, the, the less I felt like it necessarily was of interest to me. And I really wanted to be closer to the creative side of the music business. So I had an opportunity to go work um, for a gentleman named Mike Karen, who was, who was running Urban Music at the time at Atlantic Records. And um, I took basically a lateral move. I was an assistant at UTA, made a lateral move to go be an assistant for Mike. I got promoted pretty quickly and um, was basically the first hire at his company, Artist Partners, which was a new joint venture with Atlantic. That was my first opportunity in A&R and um, A&R is artist and repertoire. Uh, what that means is, you know, signing new talent, finding the right songs for that talent and then making the best music possible, putting it out. Um, had a nice, a nice run um, working at Artist Partner, uh, spent seven and a half years there as an A&R person, rose to the level of VP, um, signed a bunch of hip hop and R&B when I was there. I think most notably uh, NBA Youngboy, who's the second most streamed artist in 2022 behind Drake. Um, just to give you a sense of the scale, um, among many others, I've you know I've worked with over 20 gold or platinum artists in my career, directly signed or directly worked with. Um, uh, at the end of my time at APG uh, in 2019, I left to go become president of Capitol Records in the Universal Music System, which is where Jeff and I crossed paths most recently. Um, I was president uh, of Capitol, you know, two months in the building, pandemic hit. You know, all of a sudden, working from home, managing a new team remotely, trying to rebuild a department, an A&R department remotely, uh, which was a really exciting and interesting challenge. Um, 
And then later that year, uh, the the current, the then CEO of the company, Steve Barnett, departed and I was promoted to CEO and chairman. Um, so in the middle of the pandemic, um, ran the company through the pandemic, about 18 months, departed at the end of 2021, um, essentially to launch my venture, um, Signal Records, with uh, which is a joint venture with Columbia Records. And so that's where I am now. We've been operational for about a month and a half, building a roster and a team from scratch and, and just loving it. Um, so Jeff, that's a background a- on me. Yeah, that's an amazing background and a lot of history. And I think the the important part I want to kind of really dive into is you've done it all. I mean, when when yeah. someone says they started in the mailroom and worked their way up, it's it's a true like rite of passage that you know and understand every level of this industry, and you can actually speak with authority and 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 history on kind of why things exist. And I I, I want to always state that to any entrepreneur or any venture capitalist that that before you can go disrupt an industry or change an industry, you have to really understand why it exists the way it does. Because there's generally a lot of stories and a lot of a lot of lessons and warnings, and most of the time lawsuits about why things are the way they are. <laughs> Well, well, look, the one the one point I would add there that's interesting that I think Jeff can actually speak to even more of the history than me, just given his tenure in the business is, you know, I've spent almost 15 years in music, but I I really got into it in 2011. So when we talk about disruption and the transition from physical to streaming, you know, I almost never really had to learn the old way. So, um, mm. you, you know, executives my age, I'm 37 now, executives my age and younger are almost entirely digital um, and streaming natives, or at least iTunes store natives, right? Where um, it went from a, a sales-based business to a streaming and subscription-based business. So um, I'm looking forward to hearing Jeff's perspectives on all that stuff. But I, I also am feeling like we're ripe for more disruption. I don't think that this has been settled yet. Um, so I'm looking forward to getting into that with you today. Awesome. Awesome. Well, Mr. Burroughs, take it away. Let's let's hear uh, how you ended up here today. Uh, yeah, I, I, I do have a bit more history than, than Jeff. He's right, he's right about that. Um, I, I'm, I'm definitely an analog, an analog child, but um, but, I, but I'm figuring it out. Um, I was, uh, I was a, a kid from New Jersey, uh, went to school at Howard university to be a doctor right after getting accepted to med school. I realized that there was no way I was going to do that and, um, told my dad that I didn't want to be a doctor. And, uh, he said, that's fine, you know, but you can't live here. Um, you got 30 days, buddy. <laughs> so, you know, kind of bounced around and, um, you know, the only other thing that I really loved to do was to party. Um, so I threw parties. Uh, and through a lot of them, got lucky and made enough money to kind of make my way to Los Angeles, where I discovered the music business and worked for some small management companies. Um, you know, quickly the artists blew up. So if the artist blows up, the executive blows up. Cypress Hill, House of Pain had quick success. I matriculated onto Columbia, where I had success with uh, a little band called the the Fugees, um, where they go, I go. So um, that led me to uh, Arista Records as the director of marketing, where I met um, my good friend, Sean Puffy Combs, who we were at school together. Uh, I I was in charge of all the marketing for all the bad boy releases, as well as the urban releases, primarily urban releases from the face. So think TLC, Usher, Tony Braxton, Biggie, you know, and and on from that era. So I, I am an early hip hop guy um and when i first got in the business we could only get hip-hop records played on the weekend there'd be no such thing as an nba young boy with success that that he's been able to 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 foster uh puffy blew up quickly Uh, i became the general manager of his company um right after that and diversified our business into several non-music related brands which kind of gave me my branding bug we built sean john we built chirac we built restaurants we built a publishing company a marketing agency and, and on. And um, I, I left the company to start my own label, uh, Rise Records, where I had early success with uh, Amory and, and Neo and some management clients with Tribe Called Quest and on. Um, fast forwarding a little bit onto uh, another tenure at, at with Clive at RCA. When Clive left, we all left. I started working for Simon Cow and took my branding expertise to television uh, and worked for Simon's X Factor as well as Got Talent franchises and ran commercial globally for many years and did some of the early branding deals with Pepsi and Verizon, product businesses with Sony Electronics and on. Um, From there, I started my own brand strategy company, which I still have today. We're over 12 years in business called What Works, and we do 
brand strategy and content production and influencer strategies for uh, a whole host of Fortune 500 companies. Um, most recently, my last corporate gig was the head of marketing and partnerships for Def Jam, where Jeff and I got to hang out on a task force for a meaningful change in the wake of George Floyd's death. Um, I have heavy, heavy hand in social justice work, uh, and Jeff was quite meaningful on that on that board that we served on. Uh, when I left Def Jam about a year ago, um, I really got very interested in technology and how technology is affecting the music business, most meaningfully artificial intelligence, and joined mm. a few companies that were heavy in, in, in AI, a company called Snafu that used an algorithm to find talent as well as master use, master rights, and another company called HSF that uses AI to take compression off MP4 files. Um, everything I do is really just about making the customer experience more exciting and telling stories that are um, important to tell through artists' work. Um, the last thing I'm doing now is I'm launching a new label in conjunction with Paper Magazine called Paper Music, and we're building the label through the LGBT LGBTQ lens. Um, and that's what's up with me. That's amazing. Um, and again, a fabulous history and, and a ton of knowledge, especially when you can get go from that analog to digital conversion. Because <clears throat> anyone that really wants to understand Web3 needs to have a very ingrained understanding of Web1. Because um, Web2 web is just an evolution. It's like, hey, I'm not going to host these servers uh, locally anymore. We're going to use SaaS. We're going to, you know, mobile is now here. So there's a lot of dynamic changes. But the big difference of like having to uh, print the print the LPs, ship the LPs, you know, and deal with that logistical nightmare that it was yeah. compared to like the files moving around the world a hundred times while you guys are while you're you know kind of building the file, and then when distribution hits, um, you know, and this is the point, and, and either one of you guys kind of uh, correct me on this. We still have the archaic distribution model that existed from back in the physical days where there's different release dates, there's different release um, kind of structures based on where in the world you are today. Is that still correct? Mm, well, definitely not as archaic as it was when we made physical in, in any way, shape or form. Um, it was a very, it's a completely different world. Uh, most releases are, are but, Thursday night now um, with the major DSPs. So not so dysfunctional. Okay. So, so we've made, so we've, the progress has been made. And again, this is where my, most. Uh, we're going to ask yeah, you guys and help can, and help educate. Yeah, people can put music up whenever they want, but most come out on a Thursday night. Gotcha. So there's, yeah. there's still a little bit of drop schedule. So, yeah. so there, there's that aspect of it. And I think the most important aspect of it to artists that I speak with is just the, um, the turnaround between making a piece of music and being able to see it live for fans. And I think most, um, most distributors and even most majors now are getting to the point now where it's, almost a 48 hours uh, turnaround between like taking a demo out of the studio, putting it through some sort of distribution system and seeing it live on Spotify and Apple. Um, and so I think that's a huge, you know, a huge step forward from um, turning in music to press vinyl, you know, six months before the release, three months before release, that kind of stuff. So it's changed a lot. Yeah, the speed of, of everything is, you know, and web and, and the internet era is very fast. And when you think about the ideas and concepts of Web3, um, digital distribution of, of audio and video is, is, you know, like we've got that covered. That's, that's been, you guys can distribute, you know, as high resolution file and as deep of music as experience as you want. Um, but commerce is, is that big thing that has not changed. Um, which, which one of you would like to kind of tackle the, the current architecture of how royal, you know, how the music, the money flows, you know, in conjunction with the music? Mr. Vaughn, you want to take the first stab? Yeah, sure. Yeah, sure. I'll take a stab at it. I think. Um, so why don't we just talk about it from the moment it goes live on Apple and Spotify, right? Perfect. Um, you know, zooming out, there's there's essentially two sides to any mass uh, to any song. There's a, a master side, which is essentially the right to reproduce. Uh, and sell a piece of music. Um, and that's what the record labels typically deal in. And then there's a, a, a copyright, um, which is the underlying, you know, lyric, melody, intellectual property that make up that master. And that's typically what music publishers deal with. And so there's sort of two sides to every song and there's different royalty streams that result from each of them. Um, when a song goes live on, and this, by the way, this is like a 30,000 foot description um, from a guy that, 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 that isn't necessarily in the weeds on royalty collection and things like that. So a song goes live on, on Spotify and Apple uh, or any other platform globally. 
um, fans start to stream it, um, income is accrued through that process, you know, through the through the license agreements between a label a publisher and these platforms. Um, and over time, that that money accrues. And, you know, while the industry is making strides to be able to um, be transparent and show that accrual in real time and pay out those royalties as close to real time as possible, and that's where the business is heading. You know, typically in the past, there's an enormous lag um, between the money being collected and the money being distributed. And it's also an imperfect system in the sense that um, depending on the platform, um, it's not always a pay per play. Sometimes it's, you know, flat fees to the labels that then they then distribute to uh, songwriters, producers, artists on a um, market share basis, right? So if Sony has X number of um, percentage of the global number of streams, then they get that percentage, that percentage of the overall revenue, and then they distribute it based on the data that they have. Um, and so, you know, one of the frustrating things I think for artists, and I think the reason why the industry has always had a little bit of a tough reputation, um, even going back to the early days, right, the 30s, 40s, 50s, artists being taken advantage of, things like that, is very hard to understand how the money is is collected, how the money is distributed, where it goes. If you can't reach someone, where does it sit? Um, how do you unlock it? And so, um, you know, when we start talking about, I don't want to get too far ahead, Jay, but when we start talking about Web3 and smart contracts and some of these things, you know, that's an area, royalty collection and distribution that is obviously ripe for um, innovation and disruption. No, and, and that's exactly where I think where we can just head right into it now. Um, and, and, you know, Mr. Burroughs, I'm just gonna refer to you guys as last names to uh, simplify some confusion here. So Mr. Burroughs, uh, when, when, when you're hearing this and you're thinking about, you know, again, you, you have, you've done everything, um, you know, from, from vinyl all the way at now to, you know, M, uh, uh, NFTs and, and whatnot, how does that, the ideas of smart contracts help the distribution of, uh, currency and monetary value to the artists and everyone that works on these. Oh, well, well, Jeff and I are, are intimately affair with the, the nightmares of our business affairs departments and the challenges that it takes to get clearances, to get records out into the marketplace is one of the major stumbling blocks of getting records out into the marketplace. So the idea that artists are going to be able to, you know, in a, in a smart NFT, have a smart contract, available to their customer base directly or B, B2B, anybody who wants to engage or use that IP is able to do so is completely revolutionary. Um, you know, the, the artists don't have, today the artists don't have much control over how that happens. And I get countless phone calls from artists frustrated that, you know, this record wasn't cleared in time or that wasn't record cleared in time and we can't get it into the marketplace. So if, if artists are able to create this communication directly with their fans, then it's a revolutionary point, inflection point in, in our business. And, and, you know, jumping back again, I'm, I'm going to always expose my ignorance in, in some of these things, but these have all been defined very clearly by legal documents. Um, yes. So at the start of any engagement, you know, it's, it's, it's the talents, it's, it's the label and, and it's lawyers. Um, and so all of these, these points that you're discussing have been pre-negotiated, pre-defined, you know, they know it, it, there's very little back and forth. It's the action to actually make them happen. Is, is that correct? Uh, y y yes and no. There's, there's, unfortunately, there's always still some back and forth. <laughs> you know, there are, artists are, are people, so mm -hmm. they might sign an agreement that they don't actually agree with, uh, dependent upon how hot they get. And so you end up in, in further discussions than you might want to. So that there, there, is some, there is some gray area to so many different things in the music business. Um, and, and I wish there wasn't, you know, people, people will attempt to change their mind all the time. Yeah. And, and I think that's one of the, oh, sorry. Mr. Yeah, no, I guess I'll just jump in on what Jeff's saying. I mean, when I think about smart, smart contracts, the exciting thing for me as a creative person is just the, um, ability to cr make creation even more frictionless than it already is now. Give you an example. Um, you know, sampling has always been a, a big part of hip hop in particular, but it's a huge part of music writ large now um, and it's actually growing increasingly complicated in the sense that you know some of the artists that Jeff referenced referenced earlier the Fujis etc they would sample you know a soul record from the 60s or 70s and um, you know we'll go clear that record right we'll clear the use with the uh, copyright owners and the master owners um, of that record now today you know one generation later um, now we have kids sampling Fujis records that sampled soul records and so we're not only clearing 
the Fuji song, but we have to actually go back and clear the original uh, copyright and master from the original sample. And so there's layers, right, of, of clearances now that are kind of being stacked on one another. And mm. it's a nightmare um, trying to track down the states, songwriters, producers that no one knows where they are. Um, they probably didn't make the transition from analog to digital. They probably don't have the business managers or lawyers that are present in the industry anymore. And so um, where things could go in the future is if at some point we make a clean break and we start um, uh, being able to handle some of these things electronically, right? There's just accounts and approvals listed in a system um, dictated by the smart contract. Things could become a lot cleaner and a lot quicker, um, when I talk to people in the industry about this for the potential for it, the one thing that they raise is like doing this retroactively, meaning from a, from a going backward perspective versus a going forward perspective are two different things going backward. I don't think people can wrap their heads around trying to redo smart contracts for every contract that's ever been done in the music business. Um, where there's excitement is, is like, where can we start? Yep. Um, and how do we, how do we start, uh, in a healthy way so that in the future we deal with less and less of these issues over time. Um, and so that's, you know, for anyone that's listening, that's looking to tackle this problem, um, that might be the right way to speak, you know, to rights holders in terms of the services that you can offer or the approach that you're going to take. Yeah. And, and, and real quick, what, uh, I think one of the points that I, I always see is, you know, remember that, that at one point tower records and BMI had the highest per square foot um, or the highest dollar per square foot retail space in the world. Like it was, this was their business model. They owned Times Square. They owned, you know, uh, y- you name it, any, any high end mall, they were the number one uh, tenant and they just, they printed money. And then this digital, you know, MP3s came along and it's like, we don't need this anymore. And, and, and the, and the user's expectations changed and it did digitize your industry quite a bit, as you guys both have said. Um, and now this is this next layer. It's not changing, you know, what uh, it, it, nightmare, you know, kind of like this nightmare, kind of like everything's going to be blown up in one day. It's a phase in, it's a, it's a conversion that has to, has to happen. Um, what, where, where is that happening today? Cause the technology has been around for a little bit, um, but it's not very prevalent and it's absolutely not standardized in any way. Are you talking about smart contracts? Yeah. Is, is it even, you know, how, how much use are you guys seeing today? Is it, is it really early days? Super early days. I, I, I don't have any yeah. engagement with smart contracts currently. I don't know about you, Jeff, but no, none of the new deals that Perfect. I'm working on, it's not. Perfect. So, yeah. What about, um, if maybe you can tell the audience what, what you know about some of the platforms like Royal.io that are seeking to solve this problem. And I think the other thing just for, for the casual listener, the, you know, the person that's just the, the, the web three curious person. I mean, what does it mean when like Taylor Swift, you know, just like drops her record or when Beyonce, you know, drops her record. And I remember it was, it was such a big deal when they did the streaming before when we still had CDs, right. And they did only the streaming. Can you talk a little bit about, about that, uh, what what that means for some of these artists that everybody would would know, and then how how platforms like Royal and others are seeking to help solve these these problems. Well, there's a couple questions in there. Um, I'll tackle the Taylor Swift one first because I think it's um, important to recognize that physical product has not gone away. Um, so this is more again less less Web three and more just general music business setting the table. Um, Jeff, what did Taylor do first week? Was it 1.5 or 1.6 million copies, something like yeah. that? Last week, which was just like an enormous story for the music business, given um, you know the general tenor around um, new release music this so year. Physical, um, physical CDs? Um, no, so, so I'm going to get there. So okay. 1.5 or 1.6 million total copies of the album. That includes physical, it includes streaming equivalent albums, which just basically means you... you you know, you have a certain number of streams that equals one album. Um, it's a, it's a, you know, industry calculation. Um, I think at least five or 600,000 of those were pieces of vinyl. Um, and wow. so the vinyl business is actually bigger than it's ever been. Um, you wow. know, certainly, certainly CDs maybe function, you know, have a tiny, tiny part in that. Um, but people still really love to own physical things. Um, mm. and, and especially on artists of, you know, Taylor Swift size where, um, that she has such a dedicated fan base. They want to support her. They want to have collectibles. They want to have things that only they have exclusives, you know, unique pieces of product like that. So um, I think that the, the, the music business at the moment 
thinks of NFTs and these other um, technologies as sort of one additional ancillary layer similar to physical product, where it's another way for artists to connect with their fan bases, another way for consumers to feel like they're in the club, you know, as opposed on the outside, just a passive streaming consumer. Um, and, I, and I'm, you know, excited to see how that evolves. Um, going to Royal.io, and Jeff, feel free to jump in on this because I'm less familiar with the company. Um, you know, it's not a conversation that's come up to me, you know, in my, even in my role at, at Universal of that these things were um, imminently going to be implemented. Uh, it, I think the businesses, when I say the business, the music businesses um, approach to technology has changed, obviously, dramatically since, since the days of, of uh, the iTunes store, right? And like trying to sue people and, and all of this stuff. I think they're incredibly welcoming of new technology. Um, and, and they have, you know, all the majors have huge uh, departments full of people that are looking closely at this stuff, engaging, um, investing, et cetera, in the spaces. But they also um, take a very, very patient approach um, to implementation. I think, I think generally speaking, the industry's attitude towards some of this is, um, and, and, and honestly, like looking at the macro crypto environment, you can understand why. It's like, let's see where this settles out. Let's see where this shakes out. Let's see what the game-changing technology really is or the game-changing company really is before we do too much because obviously there's going to be a ton of work involved in, in, in sort of digitizing contracts. We did the work to dig digitize music and now there's a lot of work in digitizing contracts. So they're just taking a very patient approach. Jeff, I don't know if you have anything to well, add. I would, I, would, I would agree completely that, you know, look, the, the, the record business historically has been very slow to change, you know, all the way to the point where, you know, we were such slow adopters to downloading that the business almost completely implode. I mean, the business did implode, but almost completely went away. So I would agree with Jeff completely that, you know, they, they generally stand on the sidelines and wait until there's some company, some personalities, something that they're more sure of that the deals make really good sense. So I think that, you know, Jeff and I as entrepreneurs, we're probably a little further out in front of these things than you, you'd find at, you know, a Universal or a Sony. However, we're, we're also looking carefully at what's going to make the most sense and what actually um, is smart for our business. So I, I think you'll, you'll, you'll see a, a universal of Sony or Warner on the sidelines for quite some time until they, they feel that they can go both feet in. And I think after the, the week we're having right now with FTX imploding and, and everything else, they're, they're going to push that little piece of paper across their desk for and say, we're, we're going to hold off. But the important point, uh, you know, about this week, you know, cryptocurrencies are, is not blockchain technology. No, right. Um, and, and so there's a big differentiator I want to say right here. What, what Bitcoin does does not mean that blockchain technology is a success or failure. And, and you know, if, if Bitcoin uh, went to zero, smart contracts will, will still continue to function. Every, everything mm -hmm. still exists. Uh, as long as the chain is up and running. And so there's a big differentiator that I want to hit on from there. Um, with you guys, there's a lot of topics around Web3. And so I, I want to kind of, I'm going to throw out a couple concepts and I'd like to hear your reaction to those. Um, let's start with communities and DAOs. Um, a community is, is the lifeblood of, of the music industry as it is with Hollywood, as it is with almost everything. So you have a community and then you combine that with a blockchain technology called a DAO, Decentralized Autonomous Organization, uh, where you can have, you can give ownership, you can give voting rights, you can, you know, tons of things can happen because you have a verified identity that I know on chain who Jeff is, I, Jeff, both Jeff, both Jeff yeah. on, uh, Jeff Burroughs and Sue is. And, you know, depending on how you wanted a way to vote, I could say, look, you know, Mr. Burroughs knows, knows more than Sue. We're going to make sure he's got a little bit more of a vote or a little bit more uh, credit for this, but we're always getting feedback on things that are happening. Um, let's start with you, uh, uh, Mr. Burroughs. What, what's your kind of reaction to the, the concept of DAOs uh, coming into your industry? Um, yeah, you know, it's taken me a minute to, um, or half a minute to really get my head around DAOs in, in, in the right way. But when, when I think about, you know, the, the concept of community, um, you know, I'm, it's always exciting to me because I'm a hip hop guy. Like I'm an early hip hop guy. It was a little small baby community and I felt like I belonged. I think that consumers consistently are looking to be in communities when it comes to their music. Because for my 16-year-old kid or my 13-year-old kid, that's the badge of who they are. That's how they differentiate themselves from their old dad, who's supposed to be cool in the music business, but is absolutely irrelevant to them. <laughs> but, <laughs> but, but I think that kids want to be kids want to be that fan. 
they want to be in this community. They want they want the right sneaker, the right hat. So the idea of being in a community of this artist or or you know this community of this music is tremendously exciting. The other the other piece you know, we don't talk about scale. We don't talk about the volume of just how much music is out there now. And the idea that technology can simplify this and make these things more streamlined to collect people globally in a way that they've never been co connected um, and able to engage with each other in ways they've never been engaged. So I think DAOs are the future. Certainly uh, the artist community will fall in love with it and music makers will fall in love. I love that. Mr. Vaughn. Um, broadly speaking, you know, DAOs are really interesting to me um, for the same reasons that Jeff outlined, which is, you know, the idea of a community getting together um, and just making something happen. Right. And we all know the example of trying to buy the copy of the, the Constitution and raising the money overnight. And like, it's a really exciting thing, the power that these um, these organizations can have. Obviously, there's a lot of legal gray areas that would need to kind of be solved, um, which is a really tricky challenge, but I'm, I'm, I'm excited to see where things go. I think in terms of its application to music, there's a lot of sites where um, that will, that, that are almost music marketplaces connecting investors and artists, right? Um, where you can buy, uh, you know, a share of an artist's income um, if you, if you believe in them or um, that you can invest in a project or a song um, and that they can market that on their own, um, which are all really interesting. Like I'm all for, um, connecting creators with funding. I think it's a great thing for the music business um, to be able to, for people to champion each other and support each other through it. Um, in terms of DAOs as like functional business units, similar to labels or management companies or publishers, I'm a little less um, bullish on that just because um, I think in this environment when there's so much music being put out, and I think that the, the latest number is 60,000 tracks a day, on, on these platforms that I've been referencing earlier, Spotify, et cetera. Um, there's just so much noise. It's so difficult to cut through. Uh, you know, the major labels are actually better positioned now than they ever were to be able to um, position artists for success. And so, you know, even myself as an entrepreneur and operating an indie label, when I sit down with an artist, the most important part of my pitch is my relationship at the moment, is my relationship with Columbia Records. That's what they want to hear about. And these are kids that are uploading music directly to fans themselves, you know, within 48 hours, they want freedom. They want all of those things, but they also want to know that they're going to be heard. And so when I think about DAOs, um, I think from a funding standpoint, I think from an activism standpoint, all of it's really interesting from an execution standpoint, I'm really skeptical because uh, there's just an expertise um, that would likely be missing in any organization like that, at least at the beginning. Um, no, so I, I, don't, I don't know if that's helpful. No, no, I think it, it entirely is. There's, you know, there's a, a time and place for any and all technologies. You know, it's, it's, uh, you can, you can love, uh, you know, uh, chicken noodle soup, but you don't want to eat it for every meal. Um, and so yeah. there, there's really a lot of, a lot of that idea that, that a DAO is great for a community to be able to give feedback, um, in a variety, in an, in an authentic way of which, you know, you know, and it's verifiable. Um, but it's probably not a great way to decentralize the running of a, a multi million to multi billion dollar, uh, organization as we've seen time and time again, you know, decentralized leadership, leadership, um, continues to fail. So, um, let's jump to, to another one. Um, NFTs. <clears throat> so a, a yeah. non-fungible token, uh, and not, an NFT can be a, a video, uh, it can be a picture, it can be an audio file. It can, it can really, it's a, it's a key that unlocks something. Um, and so the concepts I've heard quite a bit, you know, is, is around like, Hey, music will be distributed as NFTs. Um, and, and NFT generally isn't, like I said, that's, it's, it, that's a part of the, the, the puzzle because then there's the technology behind there, which is where is that file? Who's hosting that file? How are you going to listen to that file? Um, if I send you an NFT today, you're going to go, you know, what music player am I supposed to listen to this on? Because the, the power is, you know, that you have Spotify and you have everything. Um, Let's, we'll go in reverse order. Mr. Vaughn, what's your reaction to kind of the thought of NFTs entering your industry? Yeah, again, I think, I think generally speaking, my mindset is always I welcome new technology. Um, I think if there's, if there's a new way to reach fans that fans are demanding, then we need to be there to provide great product and great experiences. The most important thing, Jay, I think about what you said was it, it unlocks something. And I think for me, it just has to unlock value. You know, like there has to be real value behind the NFT. I think that 
Um, the idea of selling music as an NFT, there's probably value there for the artist. I'm not so sure that there's a lot of value for the consumer in those in those cases, um, unless they're unless it's like a one of one copy of one song. But as we all know, that's not really a scalable model. That's a, the idea of making one original song for every fan. Um, certainly, there's 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 cool marketing opportunities <laughs> around it. But I think what's really exciting about um, NFTs, at least in the music space, is that I, it again goes back to that idea of community, of belonging, of access, um, of being a member of a tribe. And so, you know, the most exciting applications that I've heard and seen. You know, typically are related to um, uh, f- fan-based communities, um, touring, in-person events, um, exclusive content behind some kind of wall, right? Where an NFT gets you access to that stuff. I think that's all. That's all amazing. Um, you know, it's almost like the the we we have uh, language in some of our deals about fan clubs, and I'm like, do people still have fan clubs? Like when I when I read those, con- right? And um, when you start to think about an NFT, it's almost like, um, yeah, you just said like right technology, right, you know, right time. It's almost yep. like um, it, you could see that coming back and becoming a more important part of artist business if they're properly um, uh, leveraged. So I'm excited uh, uh, about NFTs. And I think the main thing is, it's just not to burn the consumers out. Uh, music fans are, um, they're very, they're smarter than ever and they're more discerning than ever and they have to be. And so if it feels like a money grab and it feels like I'm, you know, an artist is doing it just because other people are doing it, that's, that doesn't last very long. And it creates a negative view of the technology in the artist community and in the fan community. And so it's just important when these things are done, that they're done thoughtfully um, with the goal of adding value. Fabulous. Fabulous. I would agree, I would agree uh, with, Mr. Burns? I would agree with just about everything that, that Jeff said um, and, and mirror most of his sentiments for for me as a as a as a marketer as as well as a, a a creator, I certainly think about NFTs and the community that they build, and I think about NFTs that are used to unlock experiences um, and to and to build the community. So when I think about it, I don't th- I don't think about it as any one use case. I think that really confused me in the beginning. Like these pieces of art, are, you know, just a digital thumbprint. I really got my head around it more when I started to think about how they are communities and groups and, 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 you know, organizations. And as a, as a, as a marketer, I'm always trying to find a way to tell a story. So if I have X number of people invested in the NFT, I can communicate to them cleanly. If they're also invested into the artist overall, then, you know, we have this one-to-one relationship. So I think it's a cool marketing tool to, to utilize. I think it's going to have lots of different uses over, you know, as, as things evolve. All, all these things are super early and we're not really sure how they're going to net out. But, you know, we're, 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 we're looking at them with a careful eye to figure out the best way to utilize them. And, and like anything, we're trying to find brilliance in these things, not just, um, not just do it because it's there. Um, we're trying to find something that's really going to, as Jeff said, unlock value for the artist and for the consumer. And, and I completely agree with what you said about how early we are. I mean, right now we're we're trying to understand what the technology is while we're writing the code for what it is at the same mm-hmm. time. Um, so we're really kind of, you know, at that bleeding edge of technology and, and we can clearly see where it's going to change the world um, because we already have this lens of understanding what the MP3 did to your industry because now we can see these things coming in and anyone that wants to ignore it, you can ignore it, but it's coming. Sue, this is my last question that I'm going to uh, kick it over to you. Um, so metaverse, um, you know, one of the big, like, let's like, let's just dive into this thing here. So concerts, like listening to it by yourself in your car, you know, what, whatever you're doing is, is great, but music brings people together. It brings communities together. There's festivals, like the world, you know, since, since the, the, the time of tribes and cavemen, um, you know, music has brought people together and told stories in a variety of ways. When we think of the metaverse, and, and, and I know nothing today exists that, that can possibly, you know, recreate or replicate the, this live version. What would you guys like to see in, included in the metaverse or, or technology in the metaverse in kind of your dream? This could be a, a theoretical, you know, sidecar of, of what a live concert would be. Uh, Mr. Burroughs, I'll start with you this time. Um, you know, I have a lot of kids You know, I have four kids. So I have kids that are in screens all the time. Right. So, you know, I, I look at gaming as the metaverse. Right. So excuse me as I as I stumble around the, the, these concepts. But uh, it, the easiest way for me to try to get an understanding of it was, um, you know, what 
Travis Scott did or what Ariana did and, and how my kids lost their minds completely. So of, of course I'm someone that's, you know, grown up with, you know, big concerts and arenas and, and music festivals. My kids do not see that experience in the same way, nor, nor do they feel like they need to have it in the same way that I do. Um, so I, I think these things are an evolving concern. The idea that they can experience their favorite artist game, whatever, while sitting in the house as a parent, I kind of like that a lot. But 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 also there's the opportunity of bringing the music experience to more people in the immediate sense in a in with production value that is beyond what is capable for us on any given day. My greatest challenge as a music guy is production live production value, which generally sucks, right? It's horrible. Um, there's very few live shows that sound good. They sound horrible because you just have music bouncing everywhere. So I don't think it's ever been a very good audio experience. So I'm looking forward to working with the company that I'm, I'm with, HF, HSF, which utilizes AI to make sure things sound great. See, so the idea that the experience would sound better than ever and that we could have production values that are better than ever is exciting for me. So if there's developers that are working in relation to how do you make my favorite show come to life in a way that's, you know, unbelievable, then I'm excited about that. And I think the technology will lead us there. Um, I mean, that's what I'm most thrilled about for. No, that's, that's a great one. Uh, Mr. Vaughn. Yeah, no, I, I love what Jeff said about the quality of the, of the music and the quality of the art and the experience. I think for me, the, the main thing that's holding us back is really just, it goes back to that sense of experience and community. Um, I think community has kind of been the theme, right? As we've gone from DAOs to NFTs to now the metaverse, just um, having a experience online or in a gaming environment that is equivalent um, or better than a real life experience is probably how we get there. Um, you know, Zuckerberg goes on um, Joe Rogan and talks, you know, at length about this, about, you know, there's kind of two aspects to it. There's the human experience and actually being able to create memories digitally. Like they're so powerful that you actually remember times and places when you're, when you're there virtually with your friends. Um, and then the other piece of it, of course, is just the technology itself. Like I, I personally just can't bring myself to put an Oculus on. Um, it's not because it's not because I'm not curious about it. It's just because it doesn't, it just doesn't feel good to wear. That's just my personal opinion. I know I'm, I'm I know I'm a bit old. Right. Um, and maybe that there are like really like, Roblox natives and gaming natives that are growing up and going to be more comfortable with some of this stuff. But until it's a pair of glasses and until um, we feel it, and there can be enough people participating to where your whole friend group can be in one place, not divided up over three or four different replicated environments. Um, I think, I think there's always going to be a premium on live. And I think the metaverse will always struggle. But I think going back to Jay, what you just said, we're just so early. Um, there's no, there's not a single doubt in our business that this is a huge opportunity um, for artists, um, for rights holders and the music business in general, that, um, eventually streaming may migrate, um, in some enormous percentage, uh, to the metaverse or in-game listening. Um, and that this is something that we're going to, we need to be invested in and that we need to be really thoughtful about. Um, so we don't run into the same challenges that we ran into when we were disrupted the first time, you know, how, how is our content being consumed? How is it monetized? Um, all that stuff are, are being talked about now. Yeah, no, and, and just so you're, you're not alone or you don't feel strange, uh, Mr. Vaughn. Um, so this is the $300 Oculus um, that my 11-year-old uses <clears throat> almost every day. Him and his friends love it. They, they play games on it all the time. And and here is the $1,400 brand new Oculus Pro. And I said, here it is. He put it on for about 90 seconds. He took it off. I said, no, no, try, give it one more try. Five, <laughs> minute, five, five minutes later, he handed it back, took this one and said, this is terrible. And, you know, here's a $15 billion loss by Facebook <laughs> slash Meta um, on just entirely missing the market on what anyone wanted. It had nothing to do with, with this wasn't, the, you know, the, 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 you want glasses. You want you don't want to feel yeah. that you're you're confined to something. And this felt very confined to him. I to be honest, this thing sat here now for two weeks. I have I have two minutes of time in it. It's not a good experience. Um, but but Sue, j jump back in over here because there's a lot of questions, and I think that was a really good kind of rapid fire um, to showcase how early the technology is. But the industry at least is trying to understand and see where this stuff can th these these technologies can come into play. 
Well, and I, I think Jeff and Jeff, you're both right that the live experience will always be the premium experience, but we're starting to see theater move to Netflix, theater move to one or two experiments with streaming um, during the pandemic, you know, so it, it is, it is really gratifying to see that. And it's, and it's even more gratifying to hear, to hear the two of you saying that, that, you know, there used to be lawsuits, et cetera, and now the industry is much, in general, is much more open to, yeah. uh, to these technological innovations. Yet, I think from a royalty perspective, um, when we think about YouTube and Spotify and the other platforms, they still take the majority of the, of the revenue, if I'm not mistaken. And, and some of these new platforms would give the artists more control. So that'll be an interesting um, migration, negotiation. Um, you know, how do you see that playing out in the industry? How to be supportive of that, but understanding the rev shares might change? It's a really good question. I mean, one of the topics I wanted to discuss today was just what's happening between the industry and TikTok. Um, yes. And I know I know yes. that this isn't this isn't necessarily Web three, but I think it is illustrative of the label's approach to these conversations generally. Um, and as we talk about NFTs or the metaverse or any new platform where music is going to be a, um, a key part of the experience, which I think we can all safely say um, it will be. Um, you know, TikTok is is basically where YouTube was ten years ago, where it was this um, largely user generated, user created um, platform, sort of the wild west for copyright enforcement. Um, and the, the business learned a lot, I think, from the YouTube experience. And now I believe YouTube pays out uh, more money than almost anyone else. And if not, then they will be very soon, like in the next year or two, the number one contributor of revenue to the business. Um, and I think TikTok is basically in that same position. And, and, and if you're following the industry on music business worldwide or hits daily double, like you know that those negotiate all the major label deals with TikTok are up or um, up soon. Um, and so I say that just to say, you know, I think the music businesses um, approach lately has been let let these things scale. Um, let's demonstrate how central our, our how essential our content is to the experience on the app, and then let's sit down at the table and talk about how we keep our music on the app. Um, so so rather than so so rather than kill things before they develop or before they grow or make them go through so much red tape, it's like go ahead, like let's let's see where this goes. You can pay us a flat fee but we're going to come back later and ask for a piece of ad revenue. We're going to come back later and ask for a, uh, a per stream calculation versus, versus a flat fee. Um, and so when we think about, um, you know, where things go next, I think you're going to see, you know, the industry open up to a lot of use cases, a lot of things and trying to make it as easy as possible for tools to be developed. Um, but then, but then like at some point rights holders have to be compensated. Um, and that's why I think the industry is, is not necessarily slow. I think it's more just methodical. Um, with adoption and impl implementation and like welcoming things with open arms because they really want to let them figure out the business model, um, figure out how it's being used and then approach, you know, the negotiations thoughtfully. So I don't know if that answers your question quite so much, Sue, but that's that's what mm -hmm. I'm excited about what's happening now, because I think it's huge for the business. And I think it's, you know, illust illustrative of how music over the next 10, 15, 20 years will evolve on some of these places. I think it's incredibly exciting for us that work in it just to know um, that there's going to continue to be a bigger pie. Uh, both for artists, because it's not just it's not just the labels, both for artists and labels. Mm -hmm. You know, what's really interesting on, on that point, you're bringing up TikTok. Uh, last week, Jeff, we we were at YPO Edge uh, and the CEO came and, and spoke to us. And, he, you know, his first thing he is, is he goes, you know, if if you think TikTok is just a bunch of short videos, that's just a that's no. just a like a random like mm -hmm. off chance like that's that's not what we do, you know we're a marketing company we're we're an e commerce company we're you know we're all these things behind they they want to create you know kind of WhatsApp and 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 you know uh, Spotify Spotify like they want everything like they're really going after kind of the everything app the funny little short video clips just so happens to be what's going viral right now. So I, I think you're entirely right to approach these guys and, and let them play with it uh, to a certain extent. But, you know, at the end of the day, you know, it, it's, it's got to come back uh, and, and drive value because we've seen, you know, so many, so many tech players just gut industries um, for, for, you know, and, and gut artists and, and gut, you know, kind of royalty holders. And so I, I, I hope uh, <laughs> TikTok does not have the best record uh, for doing these things. So I hope it, it does turn out well in the end. 
So the, yeah. these, all of these different um, revenue streams now, uh, now and that will be created in the future. Um, yep. I know that you both have a passion for community and a passion for social justice and a passion for supporting early young artists. Um, and I don't necessarily mean young in age. I mean, young in, yeah. in experience because we can become an artist at, at any age. Um, where, how do you see um, both both major and minor labels and, and these new revenue streams um, supporting new and emerging artists, supporting education, music education, um, supporting... Um, their ability to make art by by creating a living wage for them and supporting social justice causes. How does it, I know Jeff, it's a big question. That? Yeah, so I'm just trying to try understand your question properly. So, how how does technology help us to develop new artists and and support artists and support social justice? Is that what you're asking? Support support new artists um, making a living wage, be, having yeah. new revenue streams, yeah. so that we have more new artists coming into the business. Supporting social justice, um, supporting music education, uh, all of the, all of those things. Um, okay, th let me take this approach to answering your question. I think that um, you know, the new music and new artists is the lifeblood of so many different businesses, like you're watching TikTok's explosion, it, it wouldn't be happening the way that it's happening without music. So um, it's always been challenging to find proper revenues for artists to, to develop. However, technology has allowed artists to create music faster and better than ever. And I don't think that that's ever going to stop. I think that, you know, the walls coming down in terms of uh, gatekeepers to distribution is also quite helpful to the evolution of art and, and artistry. Um, I don't think that that ever slows down. The, the, ch the challenge for, you know, guys like us is that, you know, we're, we're trying to weed through and, and get to where the superstars are. Um, and that has become more challenging than ever. Um, as Jeff mentioned earlier with the advent of, these gatekeepers coming down, there's that much more music. I personally play the game for superstars. You know, I, I love the idea of, of, of global hits and, and global stars. Um, and I think that stars are singular. I don't think that everybody can do what Bruno Mars does. And I don't think that everybody can do what Taylor Swift does. And I think it takes teams of people to help build those superstars. That being said, we, we need new technologies to kind of filter through where those artists are coming from. And, you know, one of the companies I mentioned earlier, Snafu, you know, can, can get through 150,000 titles a week. You know, Emma as an algorithm will get to the point in the next two years where it can digest half a million titles per week. So for, for an A&R guy on, on Jeff's staff or one of my staffs, to have to go through the 30 top songs as opposed to 150,000, you know, technology is completely changing the way that we're doing business. And I don't think that we could keep up in any other way, or we're just chasing success from a TikTok algorithm, which is going to lead us to a specific type of artist as opposed to, you know, the next Prince or the next, you know, Lizzo, which wouldn't, wouldn't pop up in those things. So, um, I know it's an indirect way of answering your question, but I, I do think that technology leads innovation. Our job is to support that innovation and that technology wherever we can. So I, I love that answer that you just gave, Jeff, and I want to expand on a couple of things because you've talked quite a bit about AI, and that's the one the one thing I have not pushed out. It's it's not generally considered a Web three uh, technology, but it it very much like resides in uh, in Web three. I think that that blockchain technologies are actually designed uh, for AI for computers. Um, humans using them is is just you know hey that's we're allowed in it, but it's not a world that we're going to succeed in it. Um, so when you're, you're kind of talking about processing a half a million songs uh, a week and being able to drive value out of those, what, it, what does it look like? What are you looking for? And, and, I, and speak kind of to any aspiring artist or producer um, that, that would, you know, is going like, hey, I want to make sure Mr. Burroughs and Mr. Vaughn, like, love my music, um, but they're not going to hear it unless it gets through the gatekeeper. 
Well, well, the you know the interesting thing about AI is we can train it to to do a lot of different things um, and to listen for a lot of different things. Uh, currently, Emma is scraping, you know, socials and and DSPs and YouTube for a couple of things: familiarity, one, um, but it's also looking for sentiment. So, how do people react, and how are people speaking about music? You know, it, it does the analysis for BPMs and 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 song content and things of that nature um it's not as easy for a creator to cut through that way because we're looking for i think jeff and i are always looking for things that are wildly different um as well as sometimes we're looking for the you know my business is doing both i'm looking for things that are wildly different and i'm looking for things that are going to keep the lights on so there's lots of records that i'm going to sign because they're massively successful. And then there's the, the few things that I just think are otherworldly that I'm going to take my time and, and try to get to the finish line. So, you know, it's the same con conversation to all artists. Keep doing what you're doing and don't be afraid to be singular. Um, how, how it gets to us is going to be how we, how my, myself right now develop the AI to look for the things that I'm most passionately after when it comes to artistry. That's fabulous. Uh, Mr. Vaughn, have you spent any time uh, with AI on your platforms? Yeah, so I'm incredibly excited about AI, but again, as a creative um, creative executive, creative person, I'm, I'm mostly interested in it, um, less from a data or discovery um, perspective, although you know, definitely excited to see what, how AI can help me sift through you know, enormous amounts of music. For me, I'm just excited about AI's potential to, you know, basically augment human creativity um, and help songwriters and help producers make even better music. Um, you can think of it almost as, um, you know, songwriting for many people is a collaborative experience, right? Going back to bands, right? So it's not a new, it's not a new phenomenon. Um, you know, when three, four or five people get together to make a piece of music, there's push pull, there's different ideas. There's um, you cycle through uh, lyrics, cycle through melodies, arrangements, structures, and the idea that a, 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 a computer or a piece of software could be a second or third person in the room, I think, um, you know, reduces the barriers to entry even more for aspiring musicians that, that might be isolated or might not otherwise be able to connect in that way. They don't live in Los Angeles or New York to be able to do something like that. That's really exciting to me. Um, I think it's, uh, and, and I think that there's, you know, exciting opportunities also for digitally native artists as well, um, where um, whether the music is AI generated or not, that there's a, an AI component to a, a digital artist. Um, uh, that, that's incredibly exciting as well. You know, I think one of the things that always excites folks in the music business is the idea of, of, of uh, properties like the Blue Man Group or like the Jabberwockies or like any, any show Gorillas. that can be gorillas, any show or artist that can be in multiple places in, at, at, at multiple times, both physically with a hologram or some other piece of technology um, or even um, uh, people in mass or whatever, um, and also digitally. And so like AI's potential to help unlock, you know, things like that, I think are really exciting. Um, and I'm certainly excited to see the lines blur and for, for new artists, new points of view, new music to be created from it. Um, before we talk more about AI, I did want to go back to the question about social justice. Um, mm -hmm. Jeff gave such a beautiful answer and, um, you know, this is definitely something that's important to me as well, but I want to present an, an, an interesting um, point of view on it and just encourage anyone that's out there creating at the moment and building in the space. You know, what I'm really concerned about is equity. Um, and what I mean by that is access. Um, when I look at these tools, um, unless you're really spending a lot of time in the space at the moment to really understand DAOs, to really understand crypto, to really understand smart contracts, these are these are actually quite difficult to understand for even for people that are experienced in the in the particular industry or even people that are experienced in um, web one or web two right and so when i talk to young artists um it's hard to explain some of these concepts or hard to give them access to the tools that they need in order to engage with them and so what i'm really excited about is over the next five ten, ten years is just seeing these things become way easier to use to create to interact with to engage with um, and I know, you know, everyone posts the memes on social media about how email is so slow and the internet will never scale and dial up and the phone line. And like we, so we know that this is going to evolve, but I think um, before we get too bullish and push the technology on people, I think we need to make sure that the creators are going to be able to use them. 
and that there's not, you know, creating additional friction because the entire business is moving in the opposite path, right? With AI, with software, with how inexpensive it is to create music. Um, anything that is even remotely difficult to achieve is just going to be passed over, which is why I think, you know, the Oculus thing struggles. It's just not a great experience yet. Um, and so on social justice, I think it's just important that we push to make these things as widely available and as easy to use as possible. Fabulous. Well said, well said. So as we, um, as we move towards close here, I want to get some, some final thoughts. Uh, and, and really this, this is designed to, you know, based on everything we've talked about, what advice would you give uh, a business professional that's, that's listening to this podcast um, for where they need to, if they want to help your industry, whether it's develop technology or they want to work in your industry um, utilizing these technologies, what would just be a, a couple pieces of advice for, for how to think um, and, and maybe what education they need to get before they, they start coding or, or, you know, saying that suddenly they're a music executive. Uh, Jeff, I'll start, Burroughs, I'll start with you. Um, I, so I think it goes back to a theme that we've, we've talked and touched on a lot, which is adding value. Like, are you another cog or are you actually making a difference for any young person creator or otherwise that I'm meeting? Um, and I have several businesses. I'm wondering how they can add value. That's what I'm listening for. Um, in, in all my conversations, I'm certainly not doing a lot of the things that I did when I was 20 something years old. So, you know, I think that, that young people have every opportunity to continue to educate us culturally about what's going on because things are moving at a pace that's unbelievable. Um, you know, and sometimes the conversations that you have around subjects light different things up. So I think that knowing that you have something that, um, the, the gatekeepers don't, the powers that be don't, and, and, and honing that into a tool that's useful. Um, and the other piece is I think that you just have to have every conversation and be willing to, to try everything as, as um, anyone that's sustained themselves in any business knows, you know, it's, it's not a straight line. Um, the, entrepreneur, the, the, the life of an entrepreneur is a complete and utter roller coaster because you keep reaching and asking for new shit because you just can't ever be satisfied. <laughs> um, so, so yeah, I, I think that this, the, the, the number one thing is to add value, whether that be in technology or other. Love that. Love that. Mr. Vaughn. First thing I would say is get a friend like Jeff Burroughs, um, <laughs> like literally and figuratively in the sense that if you want to disrupt or add value to an industry, you first have to understand what you're disrupting or adding value to. I mean, I, I get a lot of um, outreach from friends and uh, and colleagues that are interested in starting businesses in the music space. I think, um, you know, the, 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 the low interest rate environment of the last few years, we've all seen how much capital has flown into music assets. And there's a lot of talk about, oh, well, you know, buying catalogs and buying this and buying that. It's all very exciting. It's great. We, we love we love people being involved in our business. And we, we certainly think that, um, you know, the value of our assets will continue to increase over time. I think the problem is, is like, if you don't know much about the space, a lot of times you're going to make a lot of wrong turn, you know, a lot of wrong turns, you're going to run up against um, regulation, you're going to run up against rights holders. And so if you are starting a company in the space, it's really important that you on your board, on your team, uh, as a consultant, like you get with some people that have spent real time, um, and can help connect the dots and help point out some of the obvious pitfalls. Um, so that's number one in terms of advice. Um, uh, damn, I had a second one that I, I lost my train of thought. Um, Jay, what was the question again? This is lessons and learnings, uh, or anything that somebody should think about entering the industry, whether as an artist or as someone wanting to help Thank in the you. industry. Yeah. You just brought it back for me. Thanks so much. I think the most important thing is to remember that this is about artists, um, mm -hmm. and creativity fundamentally. And we've had a great business discussion today, but I think if you talk to you know, the leaders at, 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 at um, big music companies, the first and foremost thing that they care about is how do I um, help artists? And so when you're thinking about audience or you're thinking about who your customer is going to be, uh, if, if you use artists as your North Star and making their experience better or helping them cut through more or helping them be treated more fairly, those are things that the, the labels are going to want to see because their artists and managers are going to be demanding it. They're going to be used to using it maybe before they sign to a label and they're going to want that technology for themselves um, because it's a competitive advantage, right? Um, 
you know, going back to equity and social justice and treating artists fairly, all of that stuff, like real-time royalty accounting is a big deal um, that certain companies are closer to than others. Um, and certainly as soon as one gets close, all the others try and catch up. Um, so as you're building something, if the artists find it indispensable, um, I tend to feel like other businesses will find it indispensable. So focus on the artists and I think you, you can't really go wrong. I love that. I love that. Sue, what's your takeaways and warnings? Well, I, this has been a fascinating conversation and I've learned a lot. So, so thank you both. I'd like to ask just for a couple of tips. Who are the, who are the artists we should be listening to? <laughs> right. What are, give us, give us some alpha, give us, give us in some early talent that you think is going to be big that we can go listen to. Oh, wow. <laughs> Jeff. <laughs> yeah. That, I mean, that you I don't mean, have an NDA with, right? <laughs> no, that's fine. Look, um, you know, for anyone that loves hip hop and wants to reach out to me directly and talk about like the nitty gritty of, of what, what scenes are bubbling and what's next. I'm, I, I totally welcome that discussion. And Jay, you can share my, you know, we'll talk about my contact information where it can be posted. You can find me on social media, all that stuff. But I think for the audience, what's early to Jeff and I is probably what's, what's early to Jeff and I is probably too early. Um, what's, what may, what may be early, what may be early and exciting to you guys is, you know, there's a, a phenomenal, I think what's really exciting is just the proliferation of, of non-English language music in the U S right. And hmm. I think if you look at two artists, Bad Bunny and Rosalia, um, those are two names that if you, if you care about where music is going globally, I think you have to pay attention to, and I would really encourage people to check out. Um, there's a young artist named David spelled D D for V D who's absolutely fantastic that people should check out. I don't have any business associations or affiliations with any of this. I'm just giving, giving things that I would give to, to anyone that asked, um, on the hip hop side, I think the new Drake 21 Savage album is kind of a return to form for Drake. It's worth checking out if you love that. Um, on the countryside, Zach Bryan is probably the biggest breakout superstar of the year in the music business. Definitely worth checking him out. Bailey Zimmerman, another country artist worth checking out. So there's a, a few names for folks, hopefully from in different lanes um, that people can can take right. away some some fun for the holidays. Yep. Love it. Love it. Hey, uh, thank you guys so much for joining us. Uh, y Whales, this has been an episode of Why Web 3 Why would uh, the music industry want to use Web3? And I think we've uh, given quite a few uh, bits of alpha and really kind of insights into the ways a couple very seasoned executives are, are thinking about the space. Uh, and the one takeaway I'm going to say is we're still very early, um, but there's a lot of interest. There's a lot of, you know, uh, kind of symbiotic, really uh, symbiotic kind of helpfulness uh, that, that Web3 and smart contracts can bring to the industry. Uh, uh, but but we're not quite there yet, and we need to kind of uh, continue to flush out and explore this. But most importantly, um, it starts with the art. It starts with the artists. It starts with kind of you know touching people and, and community. So anyone that really wants to continue to be focused on this uh, and enter this asset class, um, community, 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 and and focus on those artists. So with that, Y Whales, we will catch you guys next time. Thank you so much, Jeff, Jeff, and uh, Sue. Thanks, Jeff. And Thank Jeff. you for having us. Wonderful discussion. Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah. Thanks so much, Jay. Thank you, Sue.